25% of guests overall and 70% of the political guests on Lex Friedman's podcast are ethnically Jewish. I have once again gone through every episode of one of the world's most popular podcasts and determined that Jewish guests are super abundantly overrepresented. And as ever, I have made the data available to the public. It's in the description section of this video. This video will just consist of a short discussion of that data, as well as a few words about Lex Friedman himself. Additionally, I hope it can serve as a place to have a conversation about what I view as a troubling state of affairs. If you know somebody who is a fan of Friedman's podcast, send this video to them to get their opinion on the matter. If you've seen any of my past videos, you might be thinking, didn't you already do this for all the guests on Rogan's podcast? Isn't this sort of redundant? And yes, I did previously go through every episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, the largest podcast in the world, and discover that 42% of the political guests that he has on are ethnically Jewish. Feel free to watch that video here. And even though the conclusions we reach from examining Friedman's podcast will be pretty much exactly the same, I still thought it was a worthwhile study to undertake. Number one, because it's not as if these two podcasts share all of the same guests. In fact, there are surprisingly very few guests in common between the two. Number two, it'll serve to reinforce the concerning state of affairs that the Rogan study first exposed. In other words, to the unaware, it will show that Rogan wasn't just a fluke. And number three, I wanted to do this study because when I first started gathering the data on Rogan's podcast, I didn't actually intend to make it into a video. I was just doing it for my own edification. Believe it or not, people like me exist. It was only about halfway through when I decided that it would be cool to post the results to YouTube. Because of this fact though, I didn't cite my sources. So when somebody was marked as Jewish on my spreadsheet, and my critics couldn't immediately find that fact backed up online, they gave me grief and said that my figures were inflated. So in order to silence these people and prove once and for all that the levels of Jewish representation I observed were irrefutable, I wanted to record all of the sources with which I confirmed a person's Jewish ethnicity. But I wasn't about to go back through almost 1900 episodes of Rogan's podcast. So I decided to take a look at what seemed to be the next most popular podcast on the internet, Lex Friedman's. Therefore, in this spreadsheet, sources for every single guest's ethnicity are listed. Only high quality sources such as Wikipedia or first-hand accounts by the guests themselves were considered. 4chan calling someone Jewish was not enough because they call everyone Jewish. And importantly, as I did in the last video, if I couldn't find any information on a person's ethnicity and they had white skin, I marked them as white, meaning it is almost a certainty that several Jewish individuals are marked in my spreadsheet as white, meaning my conclusions represent the lowest possible figures for Jewish representation. To illustrate how big of a deal this is, I had to mark 115 guests in the spreadsheet as, quote, nothing found, meaning I found no information about their ethnicity online, one way or the other. Now, you may say that for any given guest, it's much more likely that they are not Jewish as compared to Jewish, but considering the podcast we're talking about, I don't know if we can be so certain. On this note, if anybody finds any error in my spreadsheet, feel free to email me at leatheraponchan at gmail.com. That's Chan is in channel, not Chan is in Oni Chan. Include in your message the guest who is incorrectly marked or marked as nothing found along with a quality source which proves your claim, and I will update the data along with the figures for Jewish representation, which will be at the top right of the spreadsheet. Accordingly, if you want the most accurate estimates for these figures, take a look at the spreadsheet. Now, real quickly, let's go through some of these figures in the video. There are 345 episodes of the podcast available online, in which 354 guest appearances are made. Of these 354 guest appearances, 88 were by Jews or 24.9%. This means that for any given episode, there is a one in four chance that the guest Friedman has on is Jewish. And I will remind you here that Jews make up about 2% of the US population, similar to Native Americans who I never seem to see represented anywhere. Considering now only unique guests, that is excluding repeat appearances, there were 303, 70 of whom were Jewish, or 23.1%. The largest group of guests is what I'm calling the Computer Science Group. Friedman's podcast started out with a strong focus on artificial intelligence and programming, although he has since started to focus more on politics and other areas of interest. Because of this, however, 111 of his guests have been computer scientists, and 19 of these were Jewish, or 17.1%. In the scientist category, which contained 93 guests, we saw 26 Jews, meaning 28% were Jewish. And lastly, in the politics category, an astounding 70.3% of the guests were Jewish. That is, 26 out of the 37 guests who are known as political figures online. Given that 2% population figure, this means that Jews are 35 times overrepresented in this category, which I think it's fair to say has a lot more impact on people's thoughts and opinions than does the entertainment or the computer science category. As always, I will not speculate too much about what these figures mean. 
I think it's primarily important just to get the information out there. I do, however, want to talk briefly on a high level about Friedman and those like him. First off, some background. Friedman's career is not exactly storied. He attended Drexel University, where his father works as a professor. While there, he obtained his bachelor's, master's, and PhD. After graduating, he got a job working on AI projects at Google for six months, after which he was hired as an AI researcher at MIT and he has been there since 2015. On April 19th, 2018, he launched the first episode of his podcast, which at the time he called the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Within the first 20 episodes of this podcast alone, he had many big name guests on, including Elon Musk, Eric Schmidt, and Eric Weinstein. And this is not to mention a few other figures at least famous within their own walks of life. This has led some people online to speculate that he must have connections in high places. Otherwise, he, as a relative nobody, couldn't pull all these big-name guests. I think personally that, while he certainly has some connections within academia, both from his own career and his father's, we can't say for certain how strong these connections are and how much they did to pull in those guests. The fact of the matter is that he probably just used the reputation of MIT to get these figures on. People like Musk and Schmidt are just far more likely to go on a podcast if it's associated with a class that's being taught at MIT, which Friedman's was. You could pretty easily write an email that says, Hey, Mr. Schmidt, would you like to feature on a podcast about artificial intelligence that's being created as a part of an AI course at MIT. I think a lot of these guys would be receptive to that sort of invitation. Take, for example, another interview done by Eric Schmidt at Stanford as part of a class. This is on YouTube, but the channel only has 70,000 subscribers, not massive by any means. Now, of course, this could just serve to highlight the fact that there is a closed loop of academics, especially within elite universities, who serve to nepotistically elevate each other's voices. But let's not get into that. As far as the understanding within the mainstream paradigm goes, I think this all serves to explain well enough his popularity early on. And the ample airtime that he's been given on Rogan's podcast explains his popularity since then. Now, yeah, I personally think the guy's a bit dull and a poor interviewer, and probably many of you do too. I mean, he talks monotone for four hours and asks dull questions, but I can still see that with the fairest possible interpretation of the facts, it's not completely unreasonable that he is as popular as he is. So the real problem with Alex Friedman isn't that he's some sort of astroturfed figure, necessarily. Even if you think he is, that sort of claim would be difficult to prove definitively. Rather, the more definite problem with Lex Friedman is in the type of figure that we know he is. Friedman is one in a class of political entertainment figures who ostensibly opposes the status quo while in reality supporting it. He and many figures like him, Rogan, Peterson, Tim Pool to a lesser extent, appealed to a dissatisfied subset of the population by coloring themselves as rebels and outsiders, those who speak the ideas we all feel but can't say. By tossing out just a few obvious truths that most of us already agree with anyways, you know, boys have penises, girls have vaginas, men shouldn't compete with women in combat sports, they gain the trust of societal malcontents who feel starved of sanity. And once they have them on side, their platforms become nothing more than vehicles for these safe, mainstream opinions. Their audiences end up harboring a few edgy but ultimately harmless ideas about quite fringe topics that in reality very few people really care about. But their opinions on the larger political questions of the day, gays, immigration, Israel, media representation, all end up aligning remarkably well with the orthodox. These figures, with their curious blend of entertainment and politics, are nothing but sheepdogs who define the boundaries by which the flock must abide. And naturally, the sheepdog has no need to tend to those in the center of the herd, only to the ones who are getting away. So now maybe you disagree with this analysis. This final section is just my opinion after all. What's important though, and what's not up for debate, is that his show has an extreme bias in the makeup of its guests, especially the political guests. And I think people who consume his show need to understand this. What you do with this information is ultimately up to you. Many of you will, or perhaps already have decided that this isn't a big deal. Perhaps it's because you think that all these Jews don't share the same political opinions or push the same agendas. Alternatively, some of you will still believe in the notion of a higher than average Jewish IQ, which explains their overrepresentation. I'm fine as of now with any conclusion that you want to come to on the subject, so long as you do come to a conclusion. So long as you actually consider the facts that I have brought to light in this video and don't just ignore them, I will be satisfied. So please take a moment to reflect on these ideas. Verify the data for yourself so you know that I'm not lying. Again, it's available in the description section. Above all, don't let others label your ideas for you. If you believe something to be true after careful consideration, don't let others talk you out of it with anything other than a well-reasoned argument. Don't let them call it evil and shame you out of truth. And thanks for watching my video, everyone. Mr. Friedman, if you'd like to discuss with me anything that I've said in this video, it can be arranged.